Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you very much, um, Juan Pablo, for the invitation. We have the same name, so. <laughs> um, so um, I will introduce myself also a little bit just to give you an idea uh, of uh, what you should expect from this talk. And um, I'd really try to make it interesting for everybody, not necess somebody necessarily with a mathematical background, but it's a technical talk. So um, questions are more than welcome. If you don't understand anything, just interrupt me. And if the question is too complicated, we can push it to the end. Okay, so first, my background, original background is physics, but I did a PhD on computer science. Uh, and I always work in many, many interdisciplinary projects. Uh, most of them involve what's called physical devices, but uh, also we have some um, game development and a, um, let's say a mix between social and uh, infra social infrastructure, let's say, uh, studies. It's just an overview, just again, I'm, I like to say that I have a very interdisciplinary background, so I should be able to speak to you without uh, sounding like an alien, I hope. You will tell me. So, okay, this is a little bit the overview of the talk and just focus on the main things here. We're gonna talk a little bit about intelligence and computation just to set the, the, um, the basis. And then we're gonna go move into machine learning and memory systems. And I will not talk directly about big data, but I hope that with the things I'm gonna show you, I will give you um, a background or, or a basis where you can stand and digest what is hype from what is actually things that we can do and what is the status of uh, the technology nowadays. Uh, there is, you know, big data is a buzzword at the moment. There is a lot of activity around it. So it's very hard to, you know, separate what is actually a scientific or technical development from just something that's trying to pump up a product or a, an idea. You know, it's very hard sometimes to, to separate things. Um, okay, so we start with intelligence and it's a big topic. So to avoid, uh, let's say, technical discussions, I'll, I'll bring, I brought two games. So we're gonna play games, you don't have to give your answers, but uh, play the game and keep the answers in your mind. So um, the first game, you're given these four cards, and the person who gives the card tells you that there is a rule that should be obeyed by this card. And it says, if a card has a vowel on one side, then it must have an even number on the other side, right? And uh, the game is, okay, what is the minimal number of cards you need to check to verify that this rule is being obeyed, that the statement is correct, right? So you, I give you 30 seconds so you can think about it. Um, so you have to choose cards that you will flip to check whether the, the statement is true or false. Um, Think. Keep your answers in mind. We'll need them in four slides. Okay. So usually I ask people to raise their hands when they are ready, but um, it, it plays better when you have really a lot of people here. Maybe not so impressive. Uh, okay. So remember your answers. Now we're going to play another game. In this case, you are uh, hired by a bar. Uh, as a bouncer on the wall or uh, on the door or inside the, the installation and basically say look the law says that if a person is drinking alcohol they have to be at least 18 years old and the question is similar to one before is which one of this person you need to check to know whether the law is true and basically we have one person is clearly drinking beer but we don't know the age there is a girl who is not drinking there is a child who is drinking something but we don't know what is it and there is an adult that uh, is drinking some champagne, okay? So clearly above 18 years old. So again, the question is, to whom you will go and ask the ID to check whether the law is being away and we get our bar still running and not punished by the police. Um, so again, you have to choose two guys and here you can tell me when you're ready. So we don't wait the 30 seconds, I guess. Ready over there? More less people ready or? Yeah? Okay, good. That was like 12 seconds. Um, so okay, now let's, and that's where the two games, right? And uh, I usually do it with, uh, with uh, teenagers. Uh, you know, large amount of teenagers is not hard to get. So um, 
And I asked them, okay, you raise your hand when you're ready. And this game usually takes them like, in the 30 seconds, you will not get all of them raising their hands, okay? It usually takes like a minute to all of them raise their hands. And many times it happens that people choose these two cards. So the A, because if you turn it and there is no even number, then the rule is false. And they say the two because they say if I turn it, there should be a letter there, okay? Okay, it's a little bit tricky because the rule says if has a vowel, then it should be an even number and not the other way around. So this card is irrelevant, and indeed the ones you need to really check is this one, because this is not an even number. And if I turn it around and there is a vowel there, then the rule is not true. Okay, so this is the one you really need to check. These are the two you really need to check, and basically what they're trying is to test for the wrongness of the statement, not for the correctness of the statement, which would have been to turn that one there. I don't know how many mistakes, if anybody made this mistake or how you felt the problem, whether it was hard or difficult. So the, this one, all teenagers, they take about 10, 20 seconds to raise their hands. Everybody can solve this problem very quickly, okay? I don't know if for you this was particularly easier than the other one, so if you compare. But it's amazing when you sit again in a large auditorium, like after 20 seconds when you get all the hands up, well before it was not the case. And the funny thing, so of course you need to check this guy to know what's his age, and you need to make sure that the kid is not drinking alcohol. The rest is irrelevant, okay? Now, these two problems are the same problem, mathematically. You are doing exactly the same thing. But this is difficult for most people, and this is not difficult for most people. So if you're gonna talk about intelligence sometimes, and we're gonna use kind of, let's say, standardized math problem to measure some type of intelligence, we realize that the language and the wording or the type of problems, although mathematically it's equivalent, can be more difficult. And then you call people maybe solving this more intelligent than this solving this, but mathematically they're solving the same problem, right? So what is intelligence? I'll leave the question. And Alan Turing, which is the father of computation as we know it nowadays, he was very interested in this problem of intelligence, let's say, and they say if we ask a machine not to make mistakes, then it will not be intelligent in a way trying to illustrate this point that for humans, although we have the same problems, if this word, in a way, we make mistakes, if it's not word, if it's correctly word, we can solve it very easily and very, and mostly correct. Okay, so that's, so you get you thinking about intelligence, right? And the other, this is a very common uh, example in machine, in machine learning and uh, AI. So what's the letter here in the middle? Somebody can tell me. What's the letter here and what's the letter there? in the middle, the middle letter. You wanna guess? So that would be, if it's an H, this doesn't make sense, if it's an A you can say cut. And what about this one? What's the letter in the middle? Just guess, you don't, cannot be wrong. B, right, it looks like a B. Now uh, I ask you this, and this is part of the answer, so what's this letter and what's this symbol there, All right? I hope you agree, I mean, at least for me it's very clear. Now, there is no way I will see a B there, I just see a 13. Though, of course, it's the same symbol, right? So, this is when we want to do, for example, character recognition or text analysis based on the symbols we have there. Doing it with a computer the way humans do it is very hard. It requires to have a lot of other aspects involved, not only the symbol itself. So the meaning of the symbol, it could be a word, it could be a phrase, if you're analyzing text, it's not just, you know, look at the statistics of how many times it appears and things like that. You really have to look at context and meanings of the context and say so it's a very hard problem. And of course, although we have, a, for example, machines that, or intelligence that can detect handwriting for a, the post number in the cards, right? Problems like this are general OCR, it's still very, very difficult. And you need a human in the loop. Okay, so that was just to give you, you know, thinking about, okay, intelligence, eh, not so well defined, very hard problem. Uh, and then we move into computers, which is kind of like nowadays, you know, artificial intelligence, robots, robots will take over humans, and uh, machines will do everything, you, there will be jobs that will disappear because computers will be so intelligent that we will not need humans anymore. So, okay, little, so what, what, what's to compute? Mathematically, I don't know if you know it, but it's defined by, this machine here, invented by uh, Alan Turing, a uh, code breaker or computer scientist, though there was not computer science at that time. Uh, 
English, and um, he, with another guy, Alonso Church, they came up with this statement, nowadays known as the Church Turing thesis, and everything that can be computed is computable by this device. And what is this device? It's a head, like a printer head from your printer that um, can also erase. And there is a tape here, you see it here, run it up, and this machine can write symbols on this tape and can read the symbol that is here and take a decision based on that symbol. That means I move left, I move right, and I change the symbol or not, the symbol I'm looking at. So it's very simple, you have this head, it reads a number, takes a decision, left, right, and what do I do with this symbol? Should I change it or not? And uh, then it does that, and it continues running like this. So this construction, super simple, can do everything we know to do about computation. Right? Everything. Like, and this is what we're going to discuss now. There is no new model of computation that's that proved to be better than this. Every formal model of computation that have been proposed since then, and for many years, boils down to be a Turing machine, a universal Turing machine. So there's nothing much so far, it's a thesis, it's not proven, but so far all the examples humans have been able to come up with are uh, just Turing machines in a different flavor, in a different language if you want, different codings, they, the mechanisms are different, but they, what they can do is the same. They don't have more or less power than uh, the Turing model. So and then you have the Turing model is criticized because you have this idea of finite symbols and discrete symbols and you can move a finite number of things uh, and to, of course everybody has um, the answer is basically well you know this is what is important for the real world because there is finite resources something that economists maybe should learn at some point um, so there are finite resources and then uh, people say well you know but the world is continuous you have physics you know you have this continuous space and then uh, I don't know sound or whatever is continuous and the answer to this kind of model is, okay, look, if you consider how well you can measure, at some point your sensor will have resolution. And that means that although you have many states, you have a finite amount of states. There will be a signal that it may be continuous or not, but your measuring resolution, because of noise or whatever, will not be allow you to recognize one value respect to the other, so at the end you can make a, a big number of integers numbers, right? Everything is integers. And then this is the kind of the move today is this idea of information processing of systems that will run all the time and you will poke them or interact with them and then they will do something useful for you like a computer assisted whatever a mathematical proofs this you will if you look at these videos you can you know hear a computer science talking about this interactive way of doing mathematical proofs with computers and um yeah, all these kind of things. And involved here is this idea of natural computation. So if we want to look at natural systems as computers, what are they doing? Right? This is a kind of a reverse in engineer nature. It's a very hard question also, and it's quite vague. So, so far, nobody has come with a very nice, concrete definition of what it would mean to understand uh, the actual computation that a natural system is carrying on. OK? So it's vague. But it's very interesting, yeah? these are very interesting things. Okay, here are some you know, people who oppose to uh, new models. They basically say, Turing says everything that needed to say. There is no debate. Uh, so they are very, um, it's like a faith. You know? We believe in this thesis, that is true. And people that are even more scientific, they will say, well, you know, it's okay if, if people propose new models, we can revise and if after the revision, we end up being correct. You know, we are more correct than before. We are more happy. We are, there's more like, it is more likely that this thesis is true. So it is welcome that people will propose good, uh, described and well-presented uh, criticisms or uh, put into doubt these models, right? So people keep coming. And here I put some reference. You can read more about this. Uh, it's very philosophical discussion, but it's very interesting also. Okay. Within computation, there is this thing that's called analog computation. And um, what this is, basically this idea of not working with discrete sets, with continuous signals and you know, things that are smooth and stuff like that. And uh, one of the big proponents of these models uh, says this basically, well, Turing machine is not wrong, but it's irrelevant in the sense that the questions we want to answer about the natural world 
are very hard to be represented in terms of Turing machines. So you need another uh, paradigm, let's say another way of describing this process, such that this more is easier to understand. In a way, the, the games we played, you saw we have the same problem there, but one language was more was easier to understand maybe, or easy to manipulate than the other one. Although mathematically they're equivalent, this is what this guy is saying basically. Turing machine is all right, all fine, but if you want to ask things about nature and how to build computers and stuff like that, it's not the most useful stuff. Um, and again, what analog computing has been there since a long time. This is the Antiquetera mechanisms for the ones who look anthropology, uh, archaeology. This is more or less 2,000 years old, and it was a machine made of cogwheels and, and levers and cranks that uh, predicted uh, the motion of the planets they knew at that time, right? and the moon, eclipses, and stuff like that. Um, there are older, this is a mechanism, so it's a, a machine that does the calculation for you. Of course, calculation itself is much older, it's 4,000 years old with Babylonians. They already had algorithms and computer programs, but they will always run by people, you know, with the a stick and a clay tablet. So this is something very, very old. And, um, but getting closer to the computer is somehow there uh, between the wars, where machines like this start to appear. These are just a, like a mechano construction, so it's levers and cogwheels and motors, stuff like that. And you will encode your inputs in some signals. So this will be positions or velocities of things that rotate. And the machine will process that and will give you the answer in form of the speed of some disks. Okay? So you'll have to encode your problem into you know, velocities and positions, and then de read these other velocities and decode your problem and say, oh yeah, 2 plus 2 is 4, or whatever. And, um, and this was done already a long time before this machine by Charles Barrich and Ada Lovelace. But, um, Maybe these guys worked in a more standardized way than, than these forefathers. And there is cybernetics, which is also very relevant on this thing, which is this study or scientific study of control and communication in the animal and the machine. And this guy here, Norbert Wiener, who was, is, was an amazing guy, super crazy, uh, as a person interested in a scientist, super productive. Oh, I'm sorry, that's me. It shouldn't happen. Um, I'm sorry. So um, he studied how to, what we would call today, uh, control systems, like mechanical uh, system to control them with electronics. And in that time, you can see here, these are bulbs. It was all analog. There was no transistors at the time, right? Although within the time he was working on this, the transistor appeared. All his work was kind of forgotten for a long time, uh, 40 years almost, um, because he was working always in these, you know, transfer functions and continuous system and things that were relevant for the elect electric or electronics of that time. And then when we got more discrete kind of representations of the world via transistors, maybe the work of this guy became more important, like information theory and coding theory. And, uh, but both of them work almost at the same time on these analog uh, intelligent systems, right? And um, if you're interested in any of these topics I mentioned here, you should really check out Norbert Wiener's uh, at least uh, books about him, if not his books. Um, okay, so why is this? Now, if you start looking, you will see that there is a, a lot of a, papers and works that will propose these new paradigms of computation and many of them will bring this analog computation into play and the question is why and it's a very concrete and a very realistic thing. Moore's law, you, are you familiar with Moore's law about uh, computer power? So basically the Moore's law says that every year the amount of transistors and the computer power you have in your computer will double. So like an exponential growth of uh, computing power. And this is basically driven by the fact that uh, the technology was miniaturizing these transistors and you can really make them really, really small nowadays. This is the, the limit nowadays, 14, 22 nanometers. It's like a molecule, almost the size of a molecule. And, um, and when you reach this point, you have many physical limitations. You cannot uh, go anywhere. So these guys are basically used to write zeros and ones, up and down conductive and not conductive states. And this 
you cannot do if things are not too small because then you have quantum mechanics then playing a role. And, um, and the point is now, now many of these futurologists, they were saying, look, you know, the singularity, this machine that will think like humans will appear eventually because, you know, computer power will grow, grow, grow and never stop. You know, he was maybe an economist. It will grow exponentially, will never stop and then we'll get this robot that will think like a person. And um, now you say, well, you know, there is this limit for it. You will not have doubling power every year. And also if you compare it with humans, you know, you have neurons that are slow. They are not that densely packed. It depends what you compare with, but um, and they use also no power and they're super uh, noisy. They are not precise. You know, it's like what's the state of a neuron is very hard to say because so noisy, so uh, brittle. And uh, people at IBM, they started working in a workaround around this problem. So, okay, we will not double the number of transistors maybe every year, but what we're gonna do is now, we're gonna understand the problems we want to solve with the computer better and only solve it up to the resolution we actually need. For example, I don't know, if you're doing some uh, bookkeeping, right, in your computer, I don't know what's the current resolution people use, but maybe going below the cent doesn't make much sense. So you will round the cent maybe. That means a resolution of 2 to the power of minus 2, maybe 2 to the power of minus 3, but these computers of course nowadays can work down to 2 to the power of 32. So if you're running some maybe bookkeeping program, you don't need all that power. You could use much, much less and be done. It means that all the rest that you are not using, you could use it to effectively double or increase your computing power. So that's what IBM is working nowadays. It's called low computation, a uh, low precision computing systems. Okay, this is probably very alien. I see your faces. You are not in, uh, at all interested in these things. So I'll move on. <laughs> um, okay, so come machine learning. We talk about intelligence. We talk about computers, and now we bring them two together. And it's okay, can machines be intelligent and learn from data? So we state this problem of learning. And essentially what we want to do with a computer or with another device, we have some observations of a system usually as input-output. So we have, for example, um, I don't know, users and movies they like. So this will be the input and, uh, the, and then th we want to know, okay, uh, will this user like this new movie or not? Right? These kind of questions. But we want to learn it from the data itself because we have no model or you can come with one model how users take decisions to choose what movies they like. It's very hard to come with a model there. So you just want to learn it from the data. So mainly you use this for prediction, but maybe also sometimes for understanding the system you're learning. Okay, sorry for this slide. I made it quickly this morning, uh, so I couldn't make it better. But essentially the problem is written like this. You have an unknown target function, so a mapping between inputs and outputs that you don't know. This is something that's running there on the system you are studying. You know, it could be a market, uh, whatever. I don't know what system you study, but try to put there, okay, this is what my system do. You're gonna make some measurements on this system. So you're gonna these training examples where you have input and output pairs. And then you will formulate, look, whatever this mapping is cannot be anything. It's within some boundaries. So you will define, it's called an hypothesis set. You say, okay, whatever I use to model this system should be of this kind. It's a very global, very universal. They have many, many things there. So it's not an answer. It's just to say, like, this problem is framed within these kind of functions. And then comes your algorithm. It takes your hypothesis set. It takes your data as input. And it chooses from your hypothesis set the most likely function that lives there. Okay? So that's what machine learning does, essentially. You give them data, you give them hypotheses about that data, and they give you, okay, the most likely hypothesis is this one, and hopefully this guy will be able to predict new unseen input-output pairs. That's what is called the data learning problem. And uh, maybe in a more mundane way of putting it, what we just described somewhere here. So we encode our problem, remember, like this an mechanical device I show you, we send it through the machine, blah, 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 the machine runs, you know, crack, 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 and it gives you some output. And the machine learning problem is about finding this mapping here. So what is this machine doing or whatever? 
But as humans, we want to go a little step further out because the inputs, like these positions and velocities in this machine, represented something about our world. For example, represented, I don't know, prices and a amount of things or you know, emotions, interest, a social descriptors or whatever, right? And you get this, I, so here in this, uh, between these two sets is what you really want to learn. How does a, the political alignment of a person decides on their voting, things like that. This is what you want to know. To use these algorithms, you will have to encode political alignment as some kind of driving signal for the machine you're gonna use. You're gonna use that machine and you get some, and then you're gonna read out from there, okay, what will the person vote? Hmm? And this is what you really want to learn, this mapping between you know, the natural descriptions of the problem. It's the same, I was written before, but just in, in a, yeah, from a different perspective. And now I will get you through four diagrams, uh, three diagrams, that hopefully will give you a very concrete sense of what is about to predict, compute, and machine learning. So look at this lower part of the diagram here. What it here is represents that you take the state of the world of a, of a system, and by its natural dynamics, but the way it works itself, it will change this state into another one, right? And to create a, a model of that system, what we do, if we find a way to encode or represent that state into some, you know, the world of ideas, like kind of Platon was saying, we, we make a shadow of that guy here, right? So we represent it with numbers, with letters, I don't know, some representation, an abstract representation. And then we have a machinery that is able to manipulate that abstract representation and give us a future state on the abstract plane, right? But now we go back to the real world and we read, okay, look, after this system evolved or move in time, we got this new state. So we're gonna use the same representation to get an abstract symbol from it and we're gonna compare these two things. Did our abstract machinery compute something similar from what we get here? And if the answer is yes, it's similar, then you have a good model of your system. So you want this epsilon to be small. This is what is called usually physical model or just a model. Okay, let's use the same diagram to understand how we use these models to make predictions <clears throat> and become a theory. So essentially here, what we have is, let's say we have done this check many times, the one we have before, and the epsilon is really, really small, so we just can think of this as one point there. So now what we have is a system, let's say my keys, like this, and maybe the positions and the velocities of these keys are represented in this p-value, and then I will map this into some abstract representation, probably here coordinates like x, y, position, set, position, stuff like that. I will use the laws of physics, for example, Newtonian physics, to calculate what happened when I release it. Right? I will come down, pack to the ground, move some speed, so I will get a new state, some speed, maybe deformations, things like that. And then I will take kind of the inverse of this representation to tell you, look, this new abstract state, it means this in the real world. The key is on the floor and it's broken, right? So what you have actually achieved is you never actually run the real world. You use your model to predict what was going to happen. You never use the world there. You just went through your abstract representation of the world, okay? And this is what is called prediction, right? So of course, eventually we may run this thing, the world here, and then compare again, you know, to verify that the the theory was correct or not. But this is what is called prediction. Now look at this. Is the next slide is maybe the important one. What is to compute? Right? So look just visually what's happening between these two things. Right? The dashed line moves from the real world to the abstract world. So to compute, what we do is this. We think on some abstract state, for example, or some abstract statement, two plus two. Right? And then we have a machine in which we're gonna encode this. It could be, you know, like a, a levers on a calculator or buttons on a calculator and the electronic ones. You're gonna let that system run. You're gonna press, you know, equal, so that it solves the, yeah, and it will give you 
new voltages, maybe a reading on the screen or whatever. And then you're going to use that to represent the result, which will be 4. Let me go again through this. So you think 2 plus 2, right? Now, when you think 2 plus 2, it's not a 2 written in a LED display of a calculator or on the screen of a computer, right? You're thinking of maybe on something in some abstract representation of what 2 plus 2 is. Maybe you're thinking in your fingers, whatever. But when we put it in the computer, it becomes pixels, right? Black and white pixels that will say 2 plus 2, and this will internally become into voltages that go to the processor. We're going to let the processor run. It will generate new voltages that will be read, read by the graphic card and put it in your screen, and it will be black and white pixels with the shape of a 4, and then you will read it. I will say, ah, that's 4. It matches my abstract representation. So when you compute, you actually use the real world to obtain mappings for your abstract states, right? So that's a, the, kind of the dual of this thing here, right? OK. So here I want to make a, a distinction, and uh, we move into uh, the memory source world. When we have engineer systems like these kinds, we want them to be universal in the sense that we can represent many states of the world in a flexible way. And uh, we can program the way it runs. So we can write programs on it. It doesn't do one thing. It does many things. <clears throat> but when we have natural system, that means it could be an engineer system that somebody gave me. I don't know how to build it. Or it's just something I find in nature. And I want to know, OK, can I use it for computation? Or what is it computing? Then you really need to understand what the language of this system. So how are thing, or how can we encode or decode the state of that system into abstract representation that will make sense uh, to talk about computation and things like that? Usually, when you have these systems, they are specialized in the sense that they do one thing very good, right? But at doing that, they are super good. So if you have this engineer universal system running one thing, this guy will outperform it by far. Because this guy was built to do only that. Right? Well, this guy needs to be, do many, many things, probably anything, like a Turing machine. And then it will not be particularly good at a particular task. While this guy, because it only does one task or only a small set of tasks, it will be very good at it. Um, yes, so that's why maybe you have specific algorithms that are dedicated hardware, you know, for example, the graphic cards are dedicated hardware. They don't do everything the computer can do. They do just a small part, which is mapping numbers into pixels, essentially. right? And they do only that, and they do it very good. Um, we come to reservoir computing, which I hope this you will hear about it, or maybe EcoState networks. It's um, essentially the idea is that it's a mathematical model, but the idea is that if you replace what here is called the reservoir layer by a natural system, you will be able to do this, kind of learn the language of the natural system. And it goes like this. You again need some kind of input representation, and you need some kind of output representation. You're going to show some examples to this reservoir here, which is a dynamic system. You know, it, it gets some input, it changes the states, it moves around. Could be, you can think like a bucket of water that you're throwing droplets on it, then you will get all these waves and things like that. And then from those waves, you're going to read the shadows, maybe, or the reflections, or, those, or the height of the water. And uh, so you see, you're not doing anything in particular. Just, you're just letting the system do what it does naturally. And to implement reservoir computing, you do is you put your inputs, you let the system run, you read out, and then to map into the desired output space, you do a linear transformation, right? linear mapping. So you take maybe, again, some uh, heights, if you're talking about water, or some pressure, or some reflection of light on the water. These are values. Um, or you can represent them as values. You will apply a linear transformation, and you will find the linear transformation that gives you your desired output. Okay? These systems are used a lot for speech recognition, for example. So Echo state networks are particularly good at that. So you get here you, it's simulated systems. So you put some uh, dynamical systems on your computer. You run a simulation of it. And you are constantly feeding it with speech, like somebody speaking, like me now, like my microphone. And then you're going to read out some of the states of that uh, complex system. And then you're going to learn. This is the part. You're going to learn a linear mapping, which is very easy. 
to try to map into phonemes, for example. So you say when I say ah, you know, I get a signal here, it's a voltage maybe, it goes into the system, runs, and then the output should be the string A or the letter A, right? Um, that's the idea, and they are quite good at doing that. But of course, if you are going to simulate them on the computer, they are super slow because these are big systems, you shall need to be big system. But the hope is here that this you know will not do in a computer, but you will do in an actual natural system, right? For example, in a in a city. So you will take the position of people, for example, and then you will make some explosion or some alarms running on the on the corners to represent your input, and you will see how people move, and then you're going to measure where people are, and then you're going to learn a mapping from the position of people to your desired mathematical problem. Okay? This is really like that. It's crazy like that, and you can do it in many instances just like that. The important thing is you need to actuate, you need to perturb your system. Right? It's really crazy. Um, and this is one particular kind of device that is supposed to be good at that. So memory stores, ever heard of memory stores so far? Not yet? No? So if you are into the market of uh, computing, so if you want to invest in computing uh, companies, you would have surely heard about this because it's a hype, mainly driven by Hewlett Packard. So the idea is that you have these devices long known for a long time already that <clears throat> when you put a voltage on them, they will change the resistance or some characteristic they have. And when you take out the voltage, this state or this uh, characteristic will remain there. It will not be gone. So for example, uh, this is the case of um, readable DVDs, uh, writable DVDs, sorry. To write the information then you will light uh, a laser that will heat up a little bit a dye that is there. This day will change the color and will allow the, the, trans the diodes to measure a different reflection than the state before. And then you will be able to write ones and zeros. And you can do this many times. You hit it again, you erase it, and you can reheat it to get a new zero and one. So these are systems that changes the phase transition systems. And there are many kinds. Some of them are driven by diffusion. Some of them are driven by a uh, phase changes, stuff like that. And they present this property, essentially what I was saying before, it's called hysteresis. You start somewhere, you put some input, it goes there, you get a phase transition, and if you remove the voltage, it stays there. But now if you feed it in the opposite direction, it comes down here, and again, if you cut the voltage, you stay there. So you kind of start these two states where you can put the system on, and you don't need to do anything for it to remember that state. Hmm? That's why it's called memory, so it remembers the state. And um, so if you compare with nowadays memories in the computers, they need electricity to run. So if I have a, I put some data on the memory of my computer, I take out the electricity, this data is gone, right? The computer will not remember uh, that in the memory. Now in the hard disk, it's different because the hard disk is one of these non-volatile memories. So you will store something there. And um, if you take out the current, the information is there. It's like writing in paper, right? These are the systems, but they are much faster and much smaller than what we have in hard disk nowadays. Uh, some of them work like this. You essentially have two electrodes, you put a voltage, and then you start getting these branches growing between these two things. And when you remove the voltage, this branch remains there. It's a, like a physical tree, right? Of course, there is some diffusion process that will remove it, will make this that slowly it degrades and goes back to this state, OK? Um, this is a very current uh, development. It's just some guys that make these engineer systems like a bridge. You have it there. You can put the voltage between these two bridges. And then when you run, again, voltage between 0 and 1 volt, uh, you get this thing we were discussing before. So the system has a transition, goes up and down. But the important thing is that if you cut the voltage, or maybe here, you see it better. So the blue line is the memory of the system, or the internal state. And the red line is the input voltage. So you see, you put your input voltage, the system kind of changed phase, and when you shut it down, it remembers for a while that you change the state. Right? So this will be a volatile one. Um, OK, ringing any bell so far? This behavior that you see here is very common in the connection between neurons. So it's a thing called, and we have it in the, well, I will come back to, to this slide. So there is a thing called spike time independent plasticity, which is kind of what we believe is the core for 
learning in neurons or in the brain, or for intelligence maybe, is that it has this property that depending how often and how long you uh, have activity between these two neurons, they will reinforce or uh, separate each other uh, over time. So this is how, how neurons, it's believed how neurons remember and process data. So again, these memory stores, you have this idea of having a resistive memories is what HP is pumping, you know, they have gotten um, a lot of investment on something we cannot build, but they propose it anyways. And they want these guys to be non-volatile. Now, if you want to do neuromorphic computing, you need this behavior, uh, sorry, that we saw here, that it remembers, but only for a while. So it has a decay there. And uh, <clears throat> here and again, more closely, closely to natural systems, if you want to build this kind of structured device, it's very hard to put many of them in a small place. Right? Still very hard. Of course, with time, maybe in 10 years, will be as good at, we are good at putting transistors now, but currently it's very hard to have many, many of those. So one way of building is you make them grow naturally into a bath of a, a silver and a, your electrodes, and a, you let these things settle and build this kind of a mesh. They build, so these are a, silver strings that are grown this is a solution of silver, then you heat it up, then you let it cool, and then these guys start uh, growing. And of course you put before a wafer below with some connections, so you get this mesh, this mess, growing into your circuits, right? And hopefully you'll have some connections here, so you'll be able to put voltages into these guys. In this way you can get amazingly packed cables that cross like this, which is what these guys are engineering here, right? It's like a bridge. A cable goes down, another comes above, and then you get the memory store running there. So you can grow these guys and then you will get this, you know, incredible amount of uh, bridges there, but of course you don't control the size, you don't control the separation, you don't control the properties of these guys. You can still poke these guys because you can set voltages on there and you can read out the currents that's running on there, but you cannot kind of define what the properties inside. So can we use these guys to, use, to do, make computers, right? And this is what I mentioned before, you have, I'm going to skip all this, we have reservoir computing using these devices. So the idea is that you will, maybe this one, you will set your problem as voltages, driving signals from this network, you make it run, and then you will read out some currents there, or some voltages. And then you will learn a linear mapping between these voltages and the answers to your problem. Right? And like this, you will be able to harness these systems for learning. And this is, some, again, in the reservoir computing approach, it's a crazy approach. You don't really look at the properties of the system. You say, let's do this, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we try it something else. But um, some guys are taking this seriously and really doing, trying to do the proofs that, indeed, you can do classical machine learning with these devices. And, uh, I review a paper recently and the preprints in the archives um, where they show indeed that for some approximations you can show that these kind of networks, the ones we saw here, are actually solving what is called constraint gradient descent. So by doing this, what I just told you before, this guy can show, okay, if you do that to this system, you will be actually learning, minimizing a functional associated with this optimization problem and um, so they actually implement what we will call classical machine learning, right? These optimization problems, gradient descent. And um, maybe here are some details that are interesting, but uh, as we believe is the case in the brain, this omega symbol that you see everywhere, that's the topology of the network. So, and what is interesting here is that it's, a very clear instance when the optimization process going on directly involves the topology of the network. And uh, you know, if you read a little bit about brain science, you know that we separate the brain in these different parts and they connect to each other to do the actual processing. For example, you have like visual cortex and then you have uh, regions where uh, you interpret faces and also some regions where motor control is happening. So how things are connected is very important in the brain. And, um, this is called the topology of the network. 
And this is one very clear instance where the topology is involved, directly involved in the optimization. So you can, in a way you're saying like, the shape of your network is helping you or making it harder to learn or to make an optimization. And um, so this is uh, maybe interesting for some of you, I don't know. So, <clears throat> yes? Yes, sure. So uh, what do you minimize here? Because this you are really thin course, no? So for what do you minimize here? So the, this is the problem that is being solved. So I, I didn't write the functional here, but so if you look at this problem, this is like a um, mean square with some uh, regularization term, yeah. right? So you can write the functional associated with Should that. Should that be the output to see you because you minimize the input with respect to the estimated? So, yeah, okay, this is the behavior. So again, okay, I understand the confusion. So here, these are the inputs because what we are looking at is the natural dynamics of the system. So if I put some inputs on the system, what will the system do? So the states that I will read out, what are they doing? And the states are this x here, right? And uh, what he's saying is that the solution you obtain as the states of this device are actually m trying to minimize this problem. So they are kind of mapping the states through the topology to get closer to the inputs in the square in the mean square sense, and then they are trying to regular so to get the, the state as low as possible. Right? But that, this sorry, this is not about uh, the reservoir computing problem I mentioned before. But if the system is doing naturally this, you can immediately say, okay, how should I build it to get what I want here, for example. That's one of the problems. But also you can say, okay, if I now do a linear mapping of the state, so you pre-multiply this with your mapping, then you have your actual reservoir computing going on. But the proof, or what they show, is only on the natural dynamics of the system. But from there, it's easy to read how you can use it to do machine learning. That's, uh, yes, you were asking. So, so why? So here, again, there is no training involved. Here what you do is you take these networks and you feed them with some input voltages, right? And then the question they are answering is, okay, I will observe some trajectories on, on the memories of this system, right? So this W here is the internal state, the memory of these devices. So going back here to make it concrete, yeah, is this blue line. So the input in this case, U in this case, for example, will be this square signal, and then you will read out this blue line, right? And what this guy showed in some approximation of the problem, it's not the whole nonlinear problem, it's just in some uh, limit, is that the system will try to match this voltage you put as an input, right? And that is driven somehow, it's limited by the topology it has on it, and this is what it's saying. So this error here will involve the topology. Some, maybe some topologies do, are not able to reproduce it to get this close to zero, right? Yeah, you c so this is, um, what you're saying is completely equivalent, yes. So where you can look at this problem and say, okay, if the system is solving a problem, what problem it is solving? And it will be, it's trying to reproduce the input, right? Yes. But again, the way these things should be read, I guess, because here there's no learning involved, or there's no intention of making the system learn anything in particular. So I want to say, okay, this blue line we saw there, is this blue line trying to minimize some functional? Is there some optima, optimal criteria for that signal there? And that's what they show essentially, that the, the um, signal is trying to minimize the, or trying to solve this problem and there is this functional here which is basically square of the state times the input, right? So it's coming like a kinetic energy if you are familiar with that. Um, <coughs> And, and that's kind of the result. But again, it's in a limit that is maybe not the most interesting for the real devices, but again, it shows that um, there is indeed a lot of theoretical potential on these devices. That it also shows that there is a lot to do yet. It also shows that the H HP machine will have to wait a couple of years to be built, at least using memory stores. Um, and also highlights this thing that, again, when you have this complex systems that are hard to model, are hard to build, there are alternatives 
uh, to do useful things with them. There is not, the only solution is not to, you know, kind of tame this system to engineer them and build a computer like the way we know it, kind of a Turing machine. You have these alternative approaches in which um, you can leave the system with its craziness and just through interacting with it in a clever way, you can extract useful computation. Uh, this is the, the, the paradigm of reservoir computing. Um, and yeah, so a summary I wanted to make, but maybe I will jump the summary and just go to the question and answers, which I hope you have. Although if I didn't resonate with your interest, probably there will be no questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you very much. And if you have questions or you want to know more, 